today we deal, you know, I believe, with a very important topic. And I just want to say a few brief words why this is an important topic. Martin Heidegger and his relationship to issues in environmental ethics. First of all, environmental ethics is an extremely important issue today. And I don't think I need to argue why that is an important uh, issue for us today as we deal with major problems throughout the world. But the way we deal with those problems is filtered through our assumptions that to a large extent we could say come from the philosopher Rene Descartes, at least assumptions in the Western world, assumptions about being masters and possessors of nature, as Descartes put it. The second point I'd make is that perhaps in the 20th century no thinker or philosopher was more resolute in attacking those assumptions than Martin Heidegger. So his ideas are extremely relevant. They are extremely difficult because he's challenging our most basic assumptions and his works for many seem obscure and difficult. Dr. George Shields, chair or, or coordinator of the philosophy program here at KSU, a good friend and colleague of mine, will help us navigate through this difficult terrain. Uh, because I believe that every educated person should know something about this major 20th century figure, his great contributions, as well as perhaps some tragic dimensions with him. And also, we need to see at least the implications of his thought for a bioethics. So without further ado, Dr. Shields. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, some of my students and uh, colleagues uh, for coming out. Uh, uh, this paper has its origin in a much larger project that I did uh, at a conference at Western Carolina University, uh, a conference on the philosophy of Charles Hartzorn, the American philosopher, uh, who I'm going to talk about a little bit in this paper, and Robert Neville. Uh, and one of the points of commonality between those two papers was a, a discussion of uh, so part of my uh, presentation today comes uh, out of that uh, presentation, which is really uh, a return for me after uh, being involved in painting studies for uh, quite a while, uh, even through, as I explained, my master's degree, uh, and then having a long hiatus uh, from painting studies. And so, and I was rather surprised When I was an undergraduate majoring in philosophy, Martin Heidegger was among my philosophical heroes. Closely associated in my mind at the time with the thought of Paul Tillich, his colleague in philosophy at the University of Harvard in the 1920s. I believe I had found in Heidegger's being in time and some other writings at least the basis or answers to some of my my interest in Heidegger's philosophy continued, as I mentioned, as I decided to write my master's thesis on the intersection between the continental European tradition and the work of the American philosopher Charles Hartzorn, who in fact authored the first review in the English-speaking world of Heidegger's early masterpiece of being in time. Uh, and in fact, he was a traveling Harvard Sheldon fellow and took courses from Martin Heidegger and followed him from Fiber to his first appointment at the University of Harvard. Since the time of my MA thesis in the mid 1970s, I'm sure that I believe it, uh, interest in Heidegger has only continued to grow. One of the reasons it has continued to grow is that uh, there was this huge project, uh, the, the Slumpostam project, the uh, collective works of Heidegger, uh, that is uh, currently, I believe, at around uh, a little more than 65 volumes. And the projection is that this will be finished perhaps in the next five to 10 years at uh, projected 100 volumes. So that has produced a lot of scholarly activity. He has shed confining popular labels with which he was once associated with subjects existentialism. 
writes Michael Gelfman in the second edition of his commentary on being and time. Quote, Heidegger's fame and reputation have developed to such an extent that he is now recognized as the single most important thinker in the 20th century. The labels of 20 years ago have thankfully fallen away, and Heidegger is seen as a figure of such stature that there is no adequate label to designate him except his own name. While this may be overstating the situation, as perhaps Ludwig Wittgenstein has claimed to be the most important thinker in the 20th century, at least if important means influential, there is no doubting the continued prominent interest in Heidegger as judged by the constant flow of books and essays addressing his thought and the renewed interest in him on the part of such important postmodernists as Richard Gordy and Jacques Derrida. At the same time, the controversy surrounding the interpretation and assessment of this philosopher have continued to grow. Often in the background of these controversies is Heidegger's own declaration of a turning of care in Germany, in which we have mistaken a reorientation of thought away from the phenomenological analysis of human being, or Gazan, in its German term for human being to a more mystical concern with the being which grasps the vine through the language of culture. There are seemingly endless debates about how to understand the nature of this term. Is the term a reorientation which retains earlier insights of being and time, but strikes out in different, although complementary, directions, as for example, Frederick Olofsson thinks? Is the term a thorough about face, a term away from being a term? Is the term some complex mixture of retention and rejection of the doctrines of being? When does the term really occur? Some argue that there are many terms in Heidegger, being with uh, of one of the vision of what being a time, so that there's no fundamental unity even in the project of being a time. Some argue there may be four Heideggers. Uh, two belonging to being in time, a little Heidegger, and then a later, uh, a much more poetic Heidegger. Of course, I cannot adjudicate these issues here and now, and probably not in a piece less than a monograph or a book, uh, much less in a public address. My point in mentioning this at the outset is rather to indicate that Heidegger interpretation is a very complex, fragile, and contentious matter, and that everything I say here is tentative and represents a sort of snapshot of what I happen to think now. And in fact, when I was developing a paper from Western Carolina University, I probably shifted particular points six or seven times. I probably wrote five papers. Rather than being convincing and defensible at all points, I hope that my presentation will be positive and simply stimulates people to believe. For my own part, I have come to the current view that Heidegger will never again be my philosophical hero, even though I continue to hold uh, against a number of the critics who disagree with me here. I continue to hold that his work contains insights and that continued efforts at studying him are important. He will never again be my philosophical hero because of the problems with his moral character that I've encountered studying the new biography of the research, which has emerged since Victor Ferris' book on Heidegger and Nazism in 1987, uh, and quite a number of these works, to the most recent book that I have here by Daniel Baer of Captain on Heidegger's relationship with his student, the great Hannah Arendt, the Jewish political and social thinker and the seminal faculty member of New York's celebrated New School for Social Research. Apparently, Heidegger achieved one of the great public relations coups of the 20th century by recovering from his dismissal from the University of Freiburg after World War II and quietly rebuilding his reputation simply by largely refraining from discussions of his involvement in national socialism. By the time of my own college course on existentialism, the whole topic was dismissed 
and diminished was something like the following, recalling from memory. Heidegger wrote an address in which he intimated praise for National Socialism, but he quickly refuted this. By the way, if you run into Daggerberg Rooms' book entitled German Existentialism, which had a, on its frontispiece a German swastika, pay no attention to it, since it is unreasonably biased against Heidegger due to his earlier address and Rooms' own war experience. Now, with this light-hearted light assessment of the Heidegger affair in the background, it was an absolute shock to discover the actual sordid details attesting to the depth of his involvement with national socialism. Worse than the sordid details was his continuing lack of personal responsibility for his involvement after World War II. Compounding these personal, moral, political issues was his betrayal and abandonment of Hannah Arendt, his young student with whom he carried on a secret and compassionate love affair. The overall picture of this biography uh, is sort of out of this emerging. The view of a person who became intoxicated with power, as his wife Wilfred once described it, when he became director of the Friar, who harmed the lives and careers of Jewish and Catholic students and faculty of Friar betrayed close friends and supporters because of their connections to Judaism, including his own helper, mentor, supporter, and the Muslim, because of first of all his family today. And a person who was apparently very dishonest in his personal views. Uh, Hannah Arendt in a letter once described him as a notorious liar. And he was a person who, I think, uh, all the evidence showed, a very shallow perception of the consequences of his own decisions and the alternatives to the The question then is raised again. In light of this concrete picture of character form, should we listen to him? Should we take his advice concerning philosophical matters and matters as grave as the environment of crisis? How is it that brilliance in the arena of theoretical philosophy Coexist with great moral failure in the living of life. And certainly not the first person to ask this question in Heidegger's case. And in fact, there is a very large literature on what's being called the Heidegger affair. Uh, and or under the rubric of do Heidegger's critics commit the ad hominem tracks on the other stuff. So in this address, I want to argue briefly for the view that no simple or clearly generalizable assessment of Heidegger will suffice. He is an irritatingly perplexing case, an enigma, as I put it in my title, because he is both stunningly brilliant and utterly repulsive. In effect, we should glean, on my view, that we should glean what wisdom we can from him. And there is wisdom there to glean. But we should be quite wary of the limitations of his perspective, and we should read him critically. Noting, as Jacques Derrida did name, uh, whenever the evidence supports him, his attachments to the possibility and actuality of all nonsense. Professor Thomas Sheehan of uh, Loyola University puts the task as well uh, as any uh, writer in the uh, critical uh, uh, in the critical literature uh, when he points out the problem. He says. The point is not to condemn a man for his past, but to learn something about oneself in the present. Not to dismiss Heidegger's philosophical work out of hand, but likewise not to join the perpetual adoration societies that currently thrive along the Heideggerian fable in Europe and America. The task for those who care to take something from Heidegger, as you are, as she is to learn how to read him critically, both his life and his work, not to swallow his philosophy whole, but to sift it for what is still of value and what is not. So that's what I'm going to do uh, in short strokes. Let me begin by illustrating some of the insights, some of the 